Okay, good. To start over and to, by welcoming you all. Glad to see you here. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, series has been uh, going on since 2013. And as usual, we have a great lineup of, we have six talks by five speakers, heavy hitters in the field. And how do I advance this now? I, there we go. <clears throat> so three of the presentations are from previous events. I saw them and I knew they should be part of the workshop for this year. The other three, uh, for the other three, I asked each expert, what do you think is especially important for stream restoration, for stream restorations to know? And he or she selected a topic. So our, our theme for this year is stream health and good fishing. We can hold each of these as an important objective in trout stream management. They're close, closely related. Good fishing derives from stream health, of course. And we hold each important, but both of them are hard to pin down to define exactly. Something, a stream, or you for instance, can be healthy, yet always could be a bit healthier, right? Likewise, fishing can be good, but always could be better. They, like beauty, are largely in the mind of the beholder, can't be precisely measured. There are all sorts of ways to consider each one of these things, health and good fishing, but there is no unit of stream health and there is no unit of good fishing. For the fishing situation, I realize it'd be better to say satisfactory instead of good, but let's use one syllable, not five. Aldo Leopold offered a profound definition of health. He said, it is the capacity for self-renewal, self-renewal. Presentations today and tomorrow will exemplify that and we see the truth of this in all around us in recovering streams that we now have in Wisconsin and elsewhere. Leopold's statement can surely guide our, our work. Self-renewal is important. It's biological. Organisms are self-organizing. That's the characteristic of life. Cut your skin and the skin self-renews, renews, heals itself. Halt overgrazing of a stream bank and the stream self-renews. Water, mineral particles, which people call sediments, and gravity are essential, but the self part is done by plants and animals. Both photos you see here show a stream I've known and loved since 1946. What were you doing then? The stream and surroundings are an example of self-renewal. Each reach, the reach shown at left was overgrazed by, uh, was an overgrazed cow pasture when I was a kid. Barren, silty, sandy banks, little hiding cover, a fishery for puny discolored hatchery trout. In about 1970, the cows were removed. And look at it now. Plants renewed it and keep renewing it. It teems with wild trout. Healthy stream, good fishing indeed. And what about the father and son you see? They're undergoing physical and mental renewal, aren't they? Recreational fishing recreates, doesn't it? What happened to that creek has happened in much of the vast so-called dairy land of Wisconsin. And why? Because during the 1970s and 80s, dairy farmers switched from pasturing to confined feeding. This took cows off the landscape and importantly, off stream banks. Vegetation sprang up, as you see. That was the key to self-healing. Wisconsin's trout fishing is now the best in living memory. The best by far, I can assure you. People who didn't fish for trout before the 1970s, the 1960s, the 1950s, don't know how bad it used to be. Well, from Sanders. The, 
sorry about the phone here. What I want to say, and I, what I want to emphasize is that the good old days are right now. Sure, the DNR has regulated harvest better and has managed for habitat and wild trout, but the main reason has been stream self-renewal. So let's keep Leopold's words on health in mind during our two evenings of presentations. There'll be lots of detail, much of it technical, and you will receive links to recordings of the talks. So use them to go back and absorb material at your own pace. Many situations in the talks are from the Pacific Northwest and Interior West. So some details of these won't apply to streams in your area, but the principles involved will. So let's concentrate on the principles and think how they help with our work. And with that, let's go to our first presenter, Mark Beardsley. He has an MS in ecology and a bachelor's degrees in chemistry and biology. Based in Colorado, he heads a group of applied scientists named Ecometrics. And they work toward ecological health for people and nature. So with, with that mark, except for one added comment here, I'll let you go ahead. And that added comment is from Confucius. It is, when I hear, I forget. When I see, I remember. When I do, I understand. And that's important about Mark. He's a person who does. He, uh, he's, he's, he's one of us who not only did research and, and studied streams, but he went out there and designed and, and, and actually uh, oversaw construction of projects. So Mark, take it away. All right, and I'm gonna interject here and we'll get right into Mark's video just to keep us on time. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the presenters are here in the meeting. If you have questions along the way, please use the chat to ask those and Mark will be uh, on the spot to help answer those. And then we'll have five minutes for Q&A after the presentation of this uh, recording. Hi, I'm Mark Beardsley from Ecometrics in Colorado. Jessica Duran and I, along with Dr. Brad Johnson, want to share with you the way we think of stream restoration as an ecological healing process. We're ecologists, and our way of thinking differs a lot from the traditional view that comes from engineering, which frames restoration as more of a design-build exercise. We think the purpose of stream restoration is to improve ecological health. We think that streams can be treated like patients. They're complex organic systems that we can help heal and not just physical things that we can design and build. Try as we might, we can't design and build natural biotic communities or biophysical processes, but we can help them recover naturally by relieving the anthropogenic stressors. Ecological process-based restoration is healing and healing requires patience the other kind of patients. I love puns. Mostly this talk is about semantics. It's about the day-to-day -day words we use in the practice of stream restoration and what they actually mean. It's about how the words guide what we do and why we do it. Using different words may help us see the problem differently and open our minds to broader solutions. And that's what this talk's all about. The concept of ecological health is nothing new. The Journal of Freshwater Biology devoted a whole section to it in 1999. And in that section, James Carr says that health, as a word and concept in ecology, is useful because we are familiar with it. It's intuitive. People get it. Health specifically applies to people and organisms, but it also applies to ecosystems since they're also complex biophysical systems. Most practitioners use the concept metaphorically. Joe Wheaton from Utah State University, U University 
elegantly applies the stream health concept to explain process-based restoration when he speaks of giving streams a healthy lifestyle before jumping into surgery. And he has fun with it, talking about the importance of exercise, dynamic geomorphology and ecology, that is, and a proper diet, structural elements, like wood. Is your river a foodie? <laughs> of course, all this is meant to emphasize the importance of natural processes in maintaining healthy dynamic streams. By restoring natural processes, we defer detailed decision-making and liability to Mother Nature. We like this approach, and we think it's worth taking a couple steps further. Stream health is more than a metaphor. It can be a mindset that guides restoration. James Carr says that to do this, the term stream health has to be operationalized by defining it and finding ways to measure it. So let's define it, find ways to measure it. <laughs> it's an op as an operational term, stream health has to be based on something real. It can't just be a term of art. That means it has to be subjective. We have to be careful not to define stream health in terms of our own human needs and human values. I've been a, in stakeholder meetings where the moderator went around the room asking people, what's a healthy stream to you? As if the meaning of stream health could be derived from a poll of stakeholder interest. That's not right. It's too arbitrary. It's too subjective. That's not what we're going for. I've also been to lectures where the speaker said stream health and restoration goals ought to be based on what people want and not what an ecosystem needs. I couldn't disagree more. Stream health has to be an inherent property of the stream ecosystem, not just the ways we want it to serve people. And even though healthy streams are often good for people, and usually that is the case, it isn't always the case. Peter Skidmore and James Carr get us closer to operational definitions of stream health. Both use a measure of biological condition. Peter specifies aquatic and riparian species diversity. James specifies biological integrity. Both authors also say stream health is roughly inverse to the degree of human disturbance. The key point is that ecosystem integrity is at its best when all the natural parts and processes that co-evolve together are intact. Stream ecosystems change and adapt to human impacts, but when natural processes are disrupted, there's a resulting loss in natural function. Biotic definitions of stream health make sense, but it's not just the biology that matters, and it's not just the hydrology or just the geomorphology. It's the full suite of natural, physical, and biological processes that make a stream healthy and functional. There's no reason to single out a single discipline. The upper diagram shows how stream health declines as anthropogenic impacts disrupt natural, biological, hydrological, and geological processes moving from left to right. Pristine streams on the left side of the spectrum are the least impacted, healthiest, and have the most intact natural processes. Streams on the right side are the most altered for human use. On these, natural functions have been largely traded off so that streams can better meet specific human purposes. Most streams are somewhere in the middle zone where it's all compromise. The upshot is that stream ecosystems are naturally healthy until we manipulate them, either intentionally to meet important human needs or inadvertently and that stream health and natural processes are inversely proportional to the degree of anthropogenic disruption. In his famous 1997 paper, The Natural Flow Regime, Leroy Poff offered this hope. Just as rivers have been incrementally modified, they can be incrementally restored. That is, when we're done using them, or when we learn how to reduce our impact, they can be restored back to natural, functional, healthy condition. An operational definition of stream health can be derived from mainstream concept of human health, 
and that's what makes it so powerful. On the right, we've listed some common criteria that the medical profession uses to define human health, and the left column shows how these apply to streams. A healthy person performs her vital functions normally or properly. A healthy stream likewise performs its vital functions normally or properly. And we call these natural processes. And that's the root of a recently popular, popularized term, process-based restoration. Human health is anatomic, physiologic, and psychologic integrity. Stream health is physical and biological integrity. And healthy people recover from stress. Healthy streams also recover from stress. And that's precisely what we mean by the term resilience. And if human health means the ability to perform valued roles, the valued roles healthy streams play are called ecosystem services. Now I want to tell you a story. The stream in this picture here is one of the first streams Jessica and I got to work on together in the early 2000s. The property was converted for ranching and used heavily for 140 years. But now that cattle and hay production aren't primary goals, it seemed like this would be a good opportunity to put the stream back the way, the way, that, the way that the settlers found it. So we concluded that this was a sick creek and we sought professional to help us heal it. The same way you go to a clinic when something hurts or doesn't feel right. And our professional came out to the site with us and said, yes, I can be of help to you, but first you have to tell me what you want this stream to be. If you can tell me what you want, then I can design it. Well, we just want it to be healthy. Um, you're gonna have to be a little more specific. What do you mean by healthy? Well, it seems like it should have more native plants and animals. Okay, that's a start. If you identify the species you're interested in and tell me what type of habitat they need, I'll see what I can do. You need to be specific about what, what type of habitat is needed so I can design and build it. And but the first thing we have to do is get this channel stabilized. Otherwise, any habitat we build won't last. We did our best to think up some discrete habitat and biological objectives. And eventually, after lots of coaching, we settled on a short list that included bank erosion, pool depth, riparian shrub cover, and trout biomass. Our professional finally had the basis for design he needed to move forward. And here we are, 12 years later. The biotic response was pretty dismal. Looking back, it's kind of embarrassing actually how little it took to convince me that stream restoration was about designing and building stable habitat. That kind of went against most of the things I knew as an ecologist. Even if this project did meet all its objectives, which it didn't, it probably wouldn't have enabled natural processes or improved stream health very much. So what went wrong? Our point isn't to criticize the design or construction. We think the problem is actually a lot bigger than that. And in fact, the whole point of this little story was, so, was just so that I could talk to you more about semantics. It's been 16 years since that initial conversation with our restoration professional, and it finally just dawned on us that somewhere during that brief talk, we lost track of ecosystem function, natural processes, and stream health. As soon as we started talking restoration, it shifted from healing a sick stream to designing and constructing habitat. Our stream was no longer a patient. It became a design build engineering exercise. If we really want natural processes, ecosystem health and resilience, perhaps the design build process is not the best way to go about it. And that's the problem. Every restoration project I know of uses the design build language. Design is a decision making process in which science, math and engineering are applied to create things that work effectively, efficiently and safely. The key to success in any design like this one of a house is to fully understand the intended purpose and to have clear and specific objectives. If you have a definite purpose and very specific objectives, you could do the same thing to design a river. 
The next step in the process is to implement the design and build the project. So here's Bob the Builder, construction drawings in hand, making sure this house is built precisely to the design specs. And here's some guys precisely implementing a river design in the construction phase. One expectation of the design-build mentality is that once your project is built, the work is done. But, naturally, we want the stuff we just built to last and continue to function. And that's where maintenance comes in. Maintenance is the activity of keeping the things we build in good condition by checking them regularly and repairing them when necessary. Anyone who owns a house knows plenty about this. And we do this for rivers too. Here's some people doing maintenance on a river that has been repurposed for a municipal kayak park. The design build mentality works great when we're manipulating rivers for a specific purpose, like the kayak park in the previous slide, or when engineering a river to protect a road, like in this example. Well, I mean, it doesn't always work, but at least it's the right model for trying to solve this kind of problem. The reason the design-build model applies in these cases is that they have specific anthropogenic purposes described by concise and measurable objectives. And that's precisely why it doesn't work for process-based restoration, where the guiding image is a dynamic, ecologically healthy river, one like Margaret Palmer and her colleagues say it should be. It's impossible to distill this purpose into a, into a set of discrete objectives that could be effectively designed and built. We're simply not smart enough to know how to design and build these kinds of complex things. What we're really going for is the re restoration of natural processes, not specific purposes with discrete objectives. The aim of process-based restoration is to reestablish normative rates and magnitudes of the pr natural processes that create and sustain river and floodplain ecosystems. We as a society are masters of designing, building, and maintaining things to meet specific objectives, but we're not so good at designing and building natural, physical, chemical, and biological processes, not even close. I think Matthew Johnson and his colleagues said it best. We cannot replicate physically what biogeomorphology does organically. We wouldn't know how, even if we had unlimited resources. Matthew Johnson goes on to say that the issue of stream restoration comes down to empowering the agents responsible for driving biogeomorphology. We have to provide the opportunity for plants and animals and all the other natural biotic and abiotic components of a healthy ecosystem to do something only they can do, to build, maintain, and adaptively manage habitat. Empowering natural agents to reestablish natural processes. Think about that a second. That sounds an awful lot like healing. And if it's healing we're after, then why don't we use the language of healers rather than forcing ourselves to use the language of builders? Rather than treating restoration as a process of, of designing, building, and maintaining habitat, Perhaps we can look at it as diagnosing the causes of impairment, prescribing treatments, and following up with ongoing care to manage the health of the system. In doing so, restoration becomes less about the kind of things we can do to try to make the stream work the way we want it to. It becomes more about the kinds of things we can undo, the kinds of human impacts we can, we can mitigate and remove to restore the way the stream works naturally. Restoration is about correcting anthropogenic disruptions to natural processes. How we employ this mindset and practice is something we've been working on the past 15 years. We could do a whole workshop on it, but here's the gist. Rather than design a stream to meet specific objectives, we diagnose it to identify the anthropogenic impacts that disrupt natural processes. Like a medical diagnosis, we use detailed history and physical examination to target the root causes of impairment and decide which can be corrected or mitigated to expected outcomes. 
it forces us to match the scale of restoration to the scale of the problem. And it forces us to tailor restoration actions to the local potential. Those three things, the three points I just mentioned, those are the core principles of process-based restoration. The purpose of treatments is to relieve anthropogenic stress or to assist recovery after a stressor is removed. Treatments can be interventions analogous to surgery or medicine, which can sometimes involve physical manipulations in restoration and big digger trucks, just like the builders use. Or they can be therapies, passive approaches that guide healing with a lighter touch. Unlike construction, treatment isn't the end, it's a means to an end. Treatments enable and accelerate natural healing processes. Rather than maintaining the things we build, as implied by the design-build mentality, we should expect change. Ongoing care is the continued support during the healing process. And this is where the other type of patients come in. You know, patients. The design-build language we use every day implies immediate static results. We're used to evaluating success by comparing pre-project to post-project conditions, as if once you build the thing, all the restoration is over and done with. Well, phooey. This view has to change if we expect restoration to achieve the guiding image of a dynamic, healthy ecosystem that functions by natural processes. Healing's not, amid, not immediate. It usually isn't even fast. It takes time, and the results are never guaranteed. Like health management, restoration is an ongoing process. And we agree with Margaret Palmer when she said that restoration projects need to have long-term monitoring programs based on ecological assessment and adaptive management. We think changing our mindset from a design-build mentality to a healing mentality and using the words that reflect that will lead to better restoration. Or at least it's worth a try. The next time you find yourself using familiar terms like objectives, design, build, maintenance. When you're using these words in your project, just pause for a second and think. Am I really enabling nature's river restorers? Am I enabling natural processes? Is my guiding image a dynamic, healthy ecosystem? Am I restoring stream health? Oh, this stuff is semantics, all right. <laughs> but it ain't just semantics. No need for fighting there, partner, but watch your words. These things really matter. Thank you. And here's the stream health. All right. Thank you, Mark, for that wonderful talk to kick things off. Yes, well, thank, thank you very much. That, Folks, you have just heard what may be the best uh, description of modern uh, stream restoration that you're ever going to hear. That, that was just great. And uh, Mark uh, had some references uh, there in his, uh, some literature references in his talk. And I have a slide here which, uh, which uh, shows, uh, oops, how is it that I, Let's see. Can you can you see that, Eric? Not just yet. I think you have to also then click share once you have the right one. Oh, we've got to do share again. Okay. Except I don't see share right now. Darn it. If you want to email those to me, I can throw them in the, <laughs> I can share them through the chat as well so everyone has a yeah, sense good. of the, the references. Good. Um and I think at this point too, because everyone here, I don't wanna say we're all family, but it seems like everyone's here for the same purpose. Uh, if anyone has a question for Mark based on this presentation, uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask away. And don't, don't make me pick on people. Yeah, Mark is here with us, yeah. Hi everybody. <laughs> Mark, where are you joining us from? I'm in Buena Vista, Colorado. Okay, were you saying it's hot out there? It's a little warm out here, and there's a little smoke blowing in from the west. It looks like Tracy Hames might have a question for you. I got a question, yes. Um, hey, thanks so much. That was a really wonderful talk. I, I'll echo Ray's words there. 
question. So much of the stressors, so much of the things that that affect, you know, maybe a river reach or an area that we're interested in happens off site or or even miles away. And in Wisconsin, especially, sometimes it's overwhelming the number of stressors and the alterations we've done in the watershed. Um, talk a little bit about how you think about that. Um, I mean, we can be overwhelmed sometimes with all the uh, changes and things that have gone on either on site or in other areas affecting uh, the health of our rivers? That's, yeah, that's a super good question because um, context is everything. Um, and, a, and a lot of the anthropogenic stressors that impact our rivers do happen off site, which, you know, is important to recognize because if it's a, and that's one of the, one of the principles of process-based restoration is that um, knowing the source of the problem, you, you have to tailor the treatments to um, to the level where they're where they're occurring. So, you know, knowing you know, say you have a water quality issue or something that's occurring in the upper watershed, that's a problem that has to be solved at the upper watershed scale. Um, it's not something you can immediately. You, you know, you shouldn't expect to be able to treat that effectively um, with a reach scale restoration, you know, by putting in some rocks or, or adjusting habitat or something like that. Um, you know, it's not to say you can't do something to make the stream better, but there are, you know, just as in, just as in human health, there, there, there's limits to what, what you can actually heal. Yeah, it's a very, very important distinction. And I do think it's something that we often gloss over because it's, it's like you like to think you're going to be able to fix everything by, you know, making these manipulations right there on site. But Any additional questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or Ray, if you have a question, feel free to ask. My, my question, Eric, is can you see the references now? Uh, I do not see them on the screen yet, no. Son of a gun. <laughs> it's all right. We'll get it. If you email them to me, then I can figure them out, but I can't do it while we're... Yeah, I don't know, don't know how to email it to you. <laughs> uh, let's see. You tell me how to find share. Sorry, sorry to mess the proceedings up here with this technical matter, but... I don't should know be how. on your on your monitor where the Zoom meeting is happening. There should be a green thing at the bottom that says "Share Screen." I got it. Looks like uh, Faith Fitzpatrick maybe has a question. Oh, yeah. Here's oh, yeah. James. Hi. Good evening, um, Mark. I'm wondering with the um, kind of the growing um, use of stream mitigation techniques, both for like evaluating streams. Um, and then also like fixing streams, which seems to be in that very short time frame. How, how do we get this idea that things are going to take, you know, it takes longer to fix um, within things that, you know, you have payments going here and there and trade offs and that sort of thing. So you're talking about like compensatory mitigation, right? Like mm -hmm. legal. I, I That's a that's kind of a big one. I think, I think we need to be very realistic. Um, and I, it, it's hard to fit this type of mindset into what a lot of regulators want the program to be and how to work. It, it just, it, 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 sometimes these, you can't accomplish these big lifts that you want to accomplish in a small time frame or on a very small scale um, project. So I think I think it really the question is about how do we realistically account for what types of lift we can accomplish in those time frames. And I think that kind of comes down to site, you know, picking good sites to work on, sites where you know you've got site level problems that can be solved with site level treatments in a short amount of time. Those are the best, I think to me, those are the best mitigation, 
mitigation projects because they they sort of fit in that time frame. It's, it's tough if you're you know promising something 15 years out. Um, Right. You're trying to get and, paid for it in a year. <laughs> yeah, and if it's I had other factors at, you know, downstream and upstream scales. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I have a follow-up question to that. Uh, this is Kirsten. I'm a civil engineer out of northeastern uh, northeastern Illinois. Um, how I, you know, I'm. I'm on board with this concept and we do a lot of stream bank mitigation in this area too and I've found some leniency in timelines with certain grant programs or you know uh, different organizations that we're working with but one of the challenges seems to be you know permitting and regulatory agencies is you know for every small change or for every everything you want to implement if there is a, a permitting hurdle and a cost to that and time associated with it to even, you know, take the next step, how do you even contextualize committing to doing a process kind of that's going back and forth with, you know, again, multiple permitting or regulatory agencies when you're looking at something that, again, may take 10, 15, 20 years? I guess I can't say I've had much trouble on the permitting side. I mean, there's certainly had troubles with permitting, but not specifically related to, you know, long time frames or, or, you know, incremental benefits. Um, as long, you know, as far as like Clean Water Act permitting goes, I feel like as long as we're able to um, display that we, we're not causing further harm and that we have the potential of causing good over the long term, then um, we can get permitted for that. As far as getting mitigation credit, though, I do, I do think there's, I do think we're back to that, that same problem of, you know, trying to credit out. If it is a very long-term process, you, you, I don't, I actually, I guess I'll just be blunt and say that I don't think those kinds of projects should be really credited until, you know, those, some of those benefits can be demonstrated, you know, or maybe they can be doled out over time according to indicators of, you know, a positive trajectory, something like that. I don't know. Those are, those are pretty big questions. And I, I'm kind of gathering that in your area, a lot of the restoration is driven a lot more by legal means mitigation. Um, whereas here, a lot of the work we do is pretty much voluntary um, which gives us a lot of leeway. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Mark. I think we've got to go on here. Uh, can you. you see my screen now, Eric? Uh, you got to make it into the presentation mode again. So somewhere you got to click on that little screen again. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Is that, how's that? Nope, it's just the same. How's that? There we go. Now you got it. Okay, good enough. Well, our next speaker is Rebecca Flitcroft, and she is a, a uh, U.S. Forest Service 